So I'm going to talk about algorithmic differentiation, C++, and extreme estimation. And I guess I should start with the why. So what is it? What do we need it for? And when do we need it? So the slides, there's a few of them. I'm just going to cover the subset, but the full data is gonna be available online. So first, let's start with the why. The scenario is, is that we have a bunch of data, which is usually the bunch of numbers, that I'm going to call Y. What we would like to understand about this data is to either something that explains how this came about, or something that is going to tell us what that data is going to be in the future. And the tool we use to do that is called the model, which is usually just a bunch of mathematical equations that explain just that. What we need is to have some kind of connection between the model and the data. And the idea is that we try to feed the model to the data. So we would like to have something that either makes the model as close as possible to the data, which is maximizing the closeness, or something that at least tries to minimize the error. All models are wrong, some models are useful, we might as well minimize the discrepancy. There are different names of, for that. There is heavier overloading used in numerical computing. Sometimes it's called estimation. Sometimes it's called calibration. Sometimes it's called training, but it's already the same thing. Now the problem is, in general, we don't have a closed form solution that's just going to tell us the answer. It would be nice if the numbers are stock prices. We would really love to have a simple mathematical equation that tells you, well, this stock price is going to be exactly that many dollars in the future. Most of the time, we don't seem to have something that works. So the idea is to have a mathematical equation that's going to tell us at least something reasonably approximately close by minimization or maximization, in short, by extremum. And that brings us to numerical optimization, because our model is a function that is a computer program, that's the function that we would like to feed to the numerical data. So the way we can optimize a function numerically to find the parameter that makes our model fit the data the most is by numerical optimization algorithms. There are basically two classes of them. The first one is derivative-free, the second one is gradient-based. So gradient-based really means that it's just going to need a bunch of derivatives of a function. And the derivative of a function tells you how much is the output of a function changing as I change the input parameters. So you can think of the function being, for instance, the speed of a car, or let's say, yeah, let's roll with the speed of a car, and the argument being the time. Now, if you press the accelerator, the speed of a car is changing, right? So the rate of change of the speed of a car, given the rate of change in the timeline, that's acceleration, and acceleration is a derivative of a speed function with respect to time. So the rate of change of the output, given the rate of change in the input. That's basically a derivative, and you can imagine that's pretty useful if you try to find the parameter that gives you the best function value because derivative directly answers the question whether those tweaks you do in the parameters actually have any effect. So the algorithms that use derivatives, they are often better, they are often faster, they are often more accurate. There's only one problem. We don't have formulas for derivatives either for most practical applications. So that brings us to another layer of indirection. Now we would like to have a numerical algorithm that's also going to differentiate out function and it's going to tell us what is the numerical derivative of the function. And we are C++ programmers, so preferably we would like something that is fast, but also something that is accurate. It's kind of like the zero overhead principle. We often like to have a no compromise compromise. 
And it would be also nice if it's simple. So that's essentially the idea behind algorithmic differentiation. It's automatic, it only uses chain rule, which I'm going to explain, and it's also as exact as it can be on a computer. So when I say exact, that means there is probably something that is not as exact. So the question is, how does it compare to different bunch of methods? And in order to explain that, it would be a nice idea to look at how we can calculate derivatives on a computer. So there are a bunch of approaches. One of them is finite differencing. I'm mostly going to talk about algorithmic differentiation AD. There's also symbolic differentiation. But they are related. So starting with finite differencing, let's go back to the example of the speed of a car. And suppose that we denote the speed of a car with a letter F. And the argument, the letter X, is time. Now, if you would like to have some notion of acceleration of your car, what you could do is to see how much time has passed, how much has the speed increased, and get the ratio of this to approximate the acceleration. So that's pretty much all there is to finite differencing, and that's the forward difference approximation. Basically, approximate the derivative but the ratio of the changes. This is a very easy method. It's usually relatively fast if you have a small number of arguments. It's usually not very accurate. So what we improve is to use central difference approximation, which in a sense is twice as accurate, but it's also twice as expensive. So that's basically the outlay. We could analyze this with some calculus, and the bottom line is that the smaller the time step is, the better the accuracy. And that again kind of makes intuitive sense if you think about it, because the step size is your resolution. So if you were rendering this car graphically, if you are trying to have a visualization that animates the motion of the car, you can imagine that if you increase your resolution, if you make those time steps smaller, then the animation is going to become smoother because it's going to be more accurate. So that's essentially the idea behind decreasing the step size as something that makes the approximation better. Well, this idea is true in calculus. Calculus is true for real numbers. Do we have real numbers on computers? We have something similar. So it's called floating point numbers. They are slightly different. They are not associative, they are not distributive. Here's an example. You could have a bunch of numbers, number A, number B, and number C. And what we are going to do is to add A plus B plus C, then we are going to add C plus B plus A, and then we are going to see if there is any difference. So that's A plus B plus C, that's C plus B plus A. So far, so good. And that's the difference. So, what? <laughs> <laughs> Mathematicians don't like floating point numbers because they are not really <laughs> what they are used to. Now, the representation and the reason for floating point numbers, this is not a C++ standard, but most hardware follows the IEEE 754 standard. It's relatively similar to scientific notation. So if you have ever seen something like 5 times 10 raised to power 4, that's pretty much similar to how floating point numbers are stored, it's except that we have 2 raised to some other power. And the bottom line is that we basically have two main types, float, single precision, and double, double precision. And there is a way you can measure their accuracy in a relative sense. It's called machine epsilon. So you can imagine yourself standing on the number axis. There is number one. And then you ask, what's the next number after that? So you can see that on real numbers, you should be able to get arbitrarily small, arbitrarily close, right? There shouldn't be any gaps between number one 
and the number next after one. While in floating point numbers there are gaps, because we have only finite amount of memory on a computer, so we cannot store numbers to infinite precision. We have to stop the precision at some point, and that point, in terms of the floating point arithmetic, is measured by machine epsilon. So it tells you what is the gap around number one. And for single precision, that's going to be of size seven digits after the decimal point, roughly. In double precision, that's going to be 16 digits after the decimal point. So the total accuracy around number one that you can represent is just 16 digits. And the reason those numbers are called floating point numbers is that because this accuracy is actually changing. So if you move to a higher number, you have less numbers after the decimal digits. If you move close to zero, sometimes you use something crazy and slow, which is called subnormal, so let's not, don't worry about that. Let's say, in relative sense, 16 digits. So, what does it mean for us? Well, there is an implication. At some point, those floating point numbers that we are going to subtract are going to get close to each other. So remember that in this approximation, what we do is to subtract f of x from f of x plus h. If you get closer and closer and closer, at some point, the result on the computer is going to tell you that the difference is zero, even though on a piece of paper, it would not be zero. So the problem is, as we make the step size smaller, at some point, the error actually increases. We can represent this graphically, and it looks like this. So if this was just real numbers on a piece of paper, we would only see the right half of this figure, and we would have the error decreasing as the step size grows smaller. However, because we have a computers using finite amount of memory with finite precision floating point numbers, at some point as we make the step size smaller and smaller and smaller, the error actually goes up. So finite differences, not very accurate. Next idea is to symbolic differentiation. Maybe we could encode the known formulas for derivative of every single expression there is, at least every single expression that we're going to use in our program. Problem is, symbolic differentiation is mostly applicable to algebraic expression, something you could write on a piece of paper. And computer programs are, again, a little bit different. They happen to have those things called variables, which, well, vary. They also have program branches. Sometimes you have a function that calls a function that calls another function that maybe has a if statement that goes to one place to another, and this could all be overwritten, mutated, and iterated a bunch of times. So that usually doesn't happen on a piece of paper. So are we back to square one? Should we go back to finite differences? Well, no. We would like to have our cake and eat it too. We would like to have something that is automatic, but also is going to be as exact as it can be even comparable to symbolic differentiation. So that's algorithmic differentiation. It's actually been around since 1960s. It just happened to be called the backpropagation algorithm for machine learning in the context of neural networks. The idea is very simple. It's especially appealing if you have been accustomed to functional programming. You can think of your function f or any numerical function as a composition of the functions that are called by that function. Maybe those functions are also operators. Maybe those are other functions that inside have operators. But at the end, it's basically just a bunch of functions. So if you would like to obtain a derivative of this function, you could just use the chain rule. And that's the only thing from calculus you have to know to understand finite differences, excuse me, to understand algorithmic differentiation. Does it work? Well, Figure says sometimes a thousand words, so I think I'm just going to stick to the figure. There are two parameters in my model that I'm interested in, parameter A and parameter B. So that's equation number three, and that's the only thing that matters here. Let's see if this works. I'm going to simulate the data from this model, and I'm just going to give it some secret values that I'm not going to share with the numerical optimizer, 
I'm just going to keep it to myself that A should be really 0 0.10, B should be 0 0.85. Let's do it a bunch of times and let's see if we can recover them. So this is the algorithmic differentiation. You can see that we have parameter A, parameter B, 10,000 simulations, and it's pretty much on point. Now, this is finite differences. This is a bit noisier. And I actually cheated. What I did is to cheat to my disadvantage and give finite differences a chance by picking and choosing a better optimization algorithm that actually resulted in better values for finite differences. So the difference is basically 99.49% successful convergence for algorithmic differentiation and something like 3% for finite differences. That's it. There are more slides, more explanations. Best thing of all, if you would like to use this, there is a bunch of awesome open source libraries that also work with linear algebra libraries like Eigen, which I highly recommend. So check it out. Thank you.